Well, why are we so content to go prayerless? To ask it another way, what is it that motivates our prayer lives? What can sustain us here? What breathes urgency and jumpstarts our intercession? This seems like such a relevant topic for every Christian to ponder. And with that topic on the table today, we turn to a classic John Piper clip from a sermon he preached in the late 1980s. It was sent in to us by Summer, who lives in Niceville, Florida. Thank you very much, Summer, for sending this in. Here's Pastor John now addressing prayer neglect. Move a step farther when he talks about his ministry further. That was 1 Corinthians 9, 26. This is 2 Corinthians 10, 3. Though we live in the world, we are not, not carrying on a worldly war. For the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but have divine power. So ministry is war. Fighting for faith in my heart is war. Fighting for the souls of men is war. All aspects of the Christian life are war. And if I would ask you, what's the most crucial text on warfare, you would all say, what? Ephesians 6. Let's read a little bit of it. Ephesians 6, 12. We are not contending against flesh and blood. We are contending against principalities and powers and the world rulers of this present darkness and spiritual forces, hosts in the heavenly places. Therefore, clothe yourself or put on the armor of God that you might be able to withstand and stand. And then comes the list of the armor. Life is war. The enemy is awesome. And you can't see him. Most people do not believe this. How are you ever going to get them to pray when they don't believe it? I mean, they, they'll say they believe it. But watch their lives. And there is a peacetime casualness in the church. A casualness about spiritual things. There are no bombs falling in their lives. No bullets whizzing overhead. No mines to be avoided. No roars on the horizon. It's all well in America, the Disneyland of the universe. Why pray? In wartime, newspapers carry headlines about how the troops are doing. In wartime, families get together and they talk about the sons and the daughters on the front lines and they pray with wrenching concern for their safety. In wartime, they're alert, they're armed, they're vigilant. In wartime, they spend their money so differently than in peacetime. There's austerity and simplicity of life, not because those are valuable in themselves, but because there's something so grand, there's such a great cause to spend your money on rather than padding your den. In wartime, everybody is touched. We all cut back the luxury liner. You've read that great story that Ralph Winter has in the Perspectives book. The luxury liner becomes the troop carrier. And once where they slept three, they sleep nine. Once where they had place settings of 15 or 10 plates. Everything changes in wartime. And so it's clear people don't believe we're in a war. Hmm. Every house has a candle till the boys come home in wartime. People don't believe that we're in a war that's worse than World War II, that is worse than any imaginable nuclear World War III. The casualties don't just lose an arm. They don't just lose a leg. They don't just lose one life. They lose everything forever. In hell. I mean, if we believed that life is war, how different things would be. Now the connection with prayer and war is not left to our guesswork. Ephesians 6, 17. Listen to this connection. Sometimes the translations break the sentence up, miss the flow, but I'll read it the way it really is. Ephesians 6.17 Take the helmet of salvation 
The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, with all prayer. Don't start a new sentence there. With all prayer and supplication, praying on every occasion in the Spirit, keeping awake with all perseverance. Now, all, it doesn't take any exegetical ability at all to see. Prayer is the power that wields the weapon. The sword of the Spirit, take it praying. Take it praying, right? It's the power that wields the weapons of warfare. Prayer is not a civilian device. Now here's a text from John, chapter 15, verse 16, that takes a little bit of exegetical finesse. Because not everybody is used to attending to conjunctions. I'm going to read it very slowly. And I want you to listen for the word so that. And if you've got an NIV, they break the sentence and start with then. Take that then as a logical, not a temporal then. This is an absolutely crucial, logical connection if you're to understand the point of prayer in a life of war. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that Whatever you ask the Father in my name, He may give it to you. Now, think. Put on your thinking caps. Do you get it? Why is the Father going to answer the prayers that we make in Jesus' name? Answer? Because Jesus has given a mission to go bear fruit or turn it around. Why did Jesus give us a mission to go bear fruit that would remain? so that we could enjoy getting answers to prayer. Therefore, why is there prayer? For war. For wartime, not for civilian times. So I never tire of telling Bethlehem Baptist Church the number one reason why prayer malfunctions in the hands of believers is because they try to take a wartime walkie-talkie and turn it into a domestic intercom by which they ring up the maid to bring another pillow. It malfunctions. It's made for tanks. It's made for trenches. It's made for war. It won't work when you install it in your yacht. It won't work at the lake cabin. It won't work in the second and third and fourth car. So I want to give you a little rhyme. I didn't know it was a rhyme until I read my manuscript the second time. Just like that sentence. <laughs> until we believe that life is war, we will not know what prayer is for. Will that stick? Until we believe that life is war, we will not know what prayer is for. Here's what I believe has happened. God sent His Son into the world on a mission. The Son comes to us and says, My Father wants me to extend my mission to you. It's dangerous. You can't lose. The mission will succeed. He's given me these transmitters here. I'll give each one of you a transmitter. They're coded to the General's frequency. As long as you stay in battle, fighting his war in his ways, you will always have free access, access by the transmitter to the general. Now go and use them. And I'll do whatever you ask for the war, for the cause. But what have millions of Americans done? They've stopped believing in war. Life is peace, not war. There's no urgency. There's no watching. There's no vigilance. There's no strategic planning. Just easy peacetime prosperity. And they take the walkie-talkie and they try to install it in domestic places, in luxurious places, and it won't work. They can't figure out why it's not working. It malfunctions. They're not getting any signals. And so my first point this morning is... If we're going to mobilize a movement of prayer in our churches and our cities, if we're going to just sustain a heart for prayer, we've just got to believe and feel that life is war. 
we must get into our minds a wartime mentality and get out of our minds the peacetime mentality that is driven into our minds all day long by television and radio and the newspapers and the magazines. They all say, don't you believe it? Pad your life. Peace. Peace when there is no peace. Until we feel the desperation of a bombing raid and the thrill of a new strategic offensive, we'll never pray with the Spirit of Jesus. That's point number one. Powerful clip. Classic Piper. And as you can tell, he was just getting started. The clip was taken from the message, Prayer, the Work of Missions, delivered at a missions conference in Denver on July 29th, 1988. The entire message is available at DesiringGod.org. And of course, over the years, Pastor John has talked about the goodness of possessions and what they say about the generosity of the giver. That should also be factored in here. You can hear him explain this over and over throughout the years uh, on this podcast in episodes 55, 453, 849, 1135, and 1289. Uh, Nevertheless, this is a great clip sent in from Summer in Niceville, Florida. Greetings, Pastor John and Tony, she wrote us. I'm exceedingly grateful for your ministry and for this podcast. I don't recall when or where I first heard this clip on prayer, but it profoundly influenced me. It has become one of my favorite things to share with other women in discipleship settings to encourage them to pray. I am a military chaplain's wife, And the war theme particularly resonates with military spouses. In our current cultural climate, I think these words from Pastor John will be a bold and timely reminder of the spiritual war we wage and of the necessity of prayer to withstand the evil one. Amen. It is such a bold and timely reminder. Thank you, Summer. And thanks for listening to today's sermon clip. Our clips are crowdsourced. You tell us what bits of Piper sermons changed your life, and we will share that clip with the APJ audience. If you got one? Email me. Give me your name, your hometown, the sermon title, the timestamp of where the clip happens in the audio, and tell me how it impacted you. Put the word clip in the subject line of an email and send it to me at askpastorjohn at desiringgod.org. That's an email address, askpastorjohn at desiringgod.org. Well, of course, it's fitting for us to talk about praising and glorifying God. That is our calling and our great delight. But can we turn the tables and talk about God praising and glorifying God? us? This is a much more awkward question, but is it biblical to say that God will praise us? This is a fascinating question, and it's up next when we return on Friday. I'm your host, Tony Ranke, and we are rejoined in studio with Pastor John next time. We'll see you then.